Hi, I'm uh, Fazil Mila, editorial page editor of the Vancouver Sun, and I'm joined today by Professor Paul Eakins of the University College of London, who is an expert on um, environmental tax shifting. Uh, what is environmental tax shifting? An environmental tax shift is a, a systematic increase in environmental taxes, so you get more revenues from uh, environmental taxes, and you balance that by decreasing other taxes, taxes that give you disincentives to work or disincentives to make profits, like taxes on labor or taxes on profits, corporation taxes. Okay. Now, I know that you told me uh, earlier that, in fact, it has been done in uh, several U um, countries in, the, in Europe, uh, the UK, Germany, France. Um, they have done that so that it's revenue neutral in the sense that so you're not taxing people more. It, you're, all you're doing is just changing the way you're taxed. What has been the impact on industries and jobs? Because at the end of the day, people are going to be worried about whether they have a job and whether they have income. Indeed. And the impact on most industries uh, has been re relatively neutral because most industries uh, don't use a lot of energy, carbon-based energy, which has been the basis of these taxes. Um, impacts on jobs have been positive, as you would expect, because you've reduced labor taxes. So you've reduced the relative price of labor, and that means that industries are more interested in employing people. And across Europe, the kind of modeling that we get is that you might get six million extra jobs across Europe from uh, the kind of tax shift that we've been thinking about. Now, BC has certainly introduced uh, a carbon tax, the first one in North America, which has done so. Um, but at the same time, you have people suggesting that we need to have the cap and trade, as it were. Um, how, how do you see, as a policy instrument, what would your preference be for a carbon tax, or should we have cap and trade? There are two reasons why a carbon tax makes more sense at this point in time when a cap-and-trade is talking about a carbon market that is very immature. The first is that it's much simpler to implement and to administer. Uh, you don't need to count all the molecules of carbon in right. numberless industries. You don't need lots of bureaucrats to verify right. and monitor. Uh, you don't need market mechanisms. You don't need traders and futures markets. All this make work that actually uh, is necessary for a market uh, cap-and-trade scheme, which we've seen the growth of in Europe. The other very important reason why a carbon tax is better at this point in time is because it gives you a firm carbon price. So you've got the British Columbia example. Um, your low carbon entrepreneurs know that in 2012, 2013, they're going to be uh, saving $30 per tonne of carbon if they invest in low carbon now. And that kind of information is really important. And it's the kind of information you haven't got in the European trading scheme because no one has a clue what the cost of carbon is yeah, going to be. The in price can be 15 bucks one day, the next day it can be 12. In phase one of the trading scheme, the price uh, altered between uh, 40 euros per tonne, which was the maximum it got, and it went down effectively to zero at the end of phase one, so that all the people that invested in low carbon, thinking that they were going to get a return, found that they suddenly uh, had no return whatever. So firms cannot operate with that kind of volatility. I mean, people need certain amount of certainty, right? Absolutely. But why then are we so down this road on cap and trade as opposed to saying, you know what, let's just go for a carbon tax, we know what the flow price is, and let's get on with it? Well, I'm afraid that um, we have an irrational dislike of tax even when we're not increasing the overall tax burden. So even when you make it absolutely clear to people that this is a tax shift, it's not a tax increase. In British Columbia, it's been a tax shift, and the numbers are absolutely clear on that. And in the European cases uh, that you quoted, exactly the same. People don't like these discussions of the word tax, and I'm afraid the energy-intensive industries, which are obviously going to find this a challenging policy, right. they exert a very great deal of lobbying power on the policy process. And they thought initially that a cap-and-trade scheme would mean free permits, right. that the permits would be given out free, and that they would make significant windfall profits out of that. And in the European case, they have. Now in Europe, we're moving to auctioned permits, which is what economists have always recommended. And of course, businesses recognizing that they're not only going to have to pay for their carbon, but they have to pay to employ all these people to administer a cap-and-trade scheme. And there is considerable feeling among industrialists as well as among um, other people, that actually this is rather a high-cost way of reducing carbon emissions. What's your general sense, I mean, of all the literature, uh, you know, which, you know, you've done a competitiveness study, uh, so you clearly know 
what the impact would be uh, generally. I mean, there are a lot of people who are worried about their jobs in this transition to a low carbon economy. As just as when you know when we have free trade agreement, people get worried about their jobs. Likewise, here you are seeing you you potentially going to have a transition period. What do you say to those workers who feel, wow, that means you know the jobs the patterns of trade will change, the industries will relocate. What do I do? Well. I mean, I, I would encourage them to look at this as a positive development. I mean, markets shift the whole time. We get structural changes in markets the whole time. Right. Uh, industries go down, new industries come up. Right. Uh, we need to move to a low carbon economy. The climate science is absolutely clear, and the legislative mechanisms are starting to be put in place right. across the world to move to a low carbon economy. That means that new low carbon industries are going to expand, are going to provide sources of new economic growth, are going to provide new sources of jobs, and British Columbia is very well placed for that because you've got lots of renewable low carbon energy sources that you can exploit. And people need to be looking at that and thinking, there is an opportunity. I need to go into that sector. If they're in a high carbon sector, they've either got to find out a way in which that high carbon sector can become a low carbon sector, or they've got to recognize that this industry is going to become increasingly uh, challenged and less and less important. Let me, uh, one last question. I mean, you gave an example when we were in our edbo editorial board meeting about Austria making boilers out of biomass, which can be used, um, which is much more cleaner, etc. And you, your question was, how come British Columbia, because of the biomass capacity that we have, that we don't have a boiler industry? Indeed. Well, uh, it, it strikes me, British Columbia is quite like Austria, as, yeah. as it's a, quite an interesting European parallel. Austria has a lot of mountains. Austria has a lot of trees. Austria gets 14% of its primary energy from biomass, wow. which is a, a large lot. proportion. Uh, on the back of that, it has built up a boiler industry because a lot of that biomass is burnt for heat. So it exists in uh, blocks of flats, it exists in schools, uh, they pipe the hot water around, uh, that's how they keep warm, they get the hot water from that, uh, they get a lot of their space heating from that, um, and uh, it's a big industry in Austria. In the UK, we're now starting to encourage biomass, uh, use of biomass ourselves. What are we doing? We're importing Austrian boilers. We have a boiler industry ourselves, but it's not been optimized to biomass, and biomass has particular challenges. We'll get there. Our boiler industry will shift, and we will start making those boilers ourselves, I hope. But I was very struck that here you are in BC with all these trees, a uh, huge resource. Uh, people are starting to use biomass in BC now, but they're not using uh, right. British Columbia-made boilers. And I would have thought that there's an entrepreneurial opportunity for somebody. There is certainly indeed uh, there are opportunities. I hope we take advantage of them. And thank you very much for helping explain uh, what environmental tax shifting is all about and the implications.